Acts chapter 1. Look with me if you would, please. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. We're going to go through the whole book of Acts tonight. I'm going to read it all. No, I'm just kidding. Amen. Uh, we will stay in the book of Acts mostly tonight, and uh, so we'll be looking at a lot of Scripture. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible truths, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. When he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. While they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brethren. Let's pray. Father, would you help us tonight, Lord, just to... to to catch the uh, truth that you have laid up on my heart to give to the church tonight. I believe that your work is done through the local church. The Bible teaches us that you instituted the church, that you were the cornerstone, and that the apostles were the foundation stones of the church. The church began with you when you came and called your disciples. When you back to heaven, you, you left the church with the responsibility of fulfilling the work of God. Your commandment to us was to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, we are to be uh, your instrument to do the work. And Father, uh, tonight I want us, to, want us to be helped tonight as we look at this church in Acts, the, the first church, the great church. Help us, Lord, to learn. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. May be seating. Be seated. As I prayed, the church began, and many, want to, many argue about where the church began. I think it's very clear in the Bible, the church began with Christ and the apostles. Um, and uh, some want to take it back further than that. Some want to wait later than that. Some want to say it started at the day of Pentecost, but I don't believe that because the Bible says that Christ was the corner, a, found, a cornerstone of the church and the apostles are the foundation stones. And he said to the apostles, if you have an issue, take it to the church. So the church was already in existence. It started with Christ, okay? And when Christ went back to heaven, he told them to wait in Jerusalem until they be endued with power. And so they came. We find them here in Acts chapter 1. We find them in the upper room. And there abode Peter, James, and John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, Judas, the brother of James. And they all continued with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So here's the first church. I want to say this, the greatest church that ever existed was the first church in Jerusalem. There has not been since that church a church that has ever matched it. That is not because we can't match it. It is because we have allowed ourselves to deteriorate. From the moment that church began, it started to decay. From the moment that church began, false doctrine started in. But imagine being in a church where there was no denominational pressure. Being in a church where there was no false doctrine yet. Being in a church that had not been affected by the, the, the politics and been affected by uh, the, the infighting and the jealousy and the divisions and the splits. And, you know, as I run around the country, I say there are four things that are killing our churches. Number one, division. Number two, dereliction. Number three, desertion. And number four, dollars. Amen. And our churches are not being as successful as we ought to be uh, because we have, we've gone away from being spirit-filled Christians. 
Uh, Brother Howard preached on Wednesday night about the Spirit and walking in the Spirit, being led of the Spirit. And the truth of the matter is that we've been scared away from the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. And I tell you what, uh, uh, we need the Spirit of God more than we need anything in all the world. But anyway, there's a great church. Let me show you through Acts chapter 1 and verse 15. The Bible tells us that the number of them was 120. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of the names together were about 120. So this first church was a group of 120 people. Pretty good membership. Uh, 120 uh, member church is not bad, amen? I mean, I pastored for uh, 26 years, and we, we had some high days in th almost 300, but we averaged about 175 in our good years and about 100 and 125 or so in our, in our tough years. And that's a pretty good-sized church, amen? But notice what happens now in Acts chapter 2. Go with me there. I'm going to give you some scripture. Just stay with me and follow. We're going to move fast because I don't want to keep you here till midnight, amen? Paul did that, but I don't want to, amen? Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. It says, Then they gladly received his word and were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now, on the day of Pentecost, the church jumps from 120 to 3,120 one day. That's quite a church. That's quite a moving of God. That's quite, that's quite a work, amen? And, and this is the greatest church that ever existed. I, I don't, when I get done, I don't believe you'll, you'll disagree. Look at verse 47. They were praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to, church, to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, daily people are being saved. You know, I think it would be great for every church to have this goal that somebody, in that somebody would be saved as a result of our church every day. Yeah, we don't even care if somebody gets saved every month, it seems. We don't care if somebody gets saved every, every six months. But we ought to have such a passion that we'd want to see somebody saved every day. We're going to see somebody saved every day if we don't go witnessing. Ain't going to happen. Amen? Now, this church was an amazing church. Go to Acts chapter 4 and verse 4 with me. The Bible says, And how many of them, and how, how, how be it, many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John go up to the temple one day at prayer, and a lame man asked them for money. Peter says, Silver and gold have I none, but such I give unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I have unlocked. And when, when this was noised abroad in the temple, it says here that 5,000 men got saved. Now we have a church that's somewhere around 9,000 to 10,000 people. And the greatest church that ever existed. Greatest church that ever existed. Look at Acts chapter 4 and verse 32. The Bible here says, And the multitude of them which believed. Now the Bible says we've come to the place that's a multitude. Why would the Bible use the word multitude? I guess because it's innumerable. I guess because it became so big, the, the work of God and the spreading of the gospel and the, and the salvation of people came to the place where there was a multitude. You go with me in verse, uh, chapter 5 and verse 14. And the believers were added to the Lord multitudes, both of men and women. Look at verse 16. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about Jerusalem. Bring in the six folks. Look at verse cha chapter 6 and verse 7. The word of God increased. Chapter 6 and verse 7. The word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied. Now we have a multitude that's multiplied. You know, multiply, multiplication would have to be at least twice. I'm telling you, this is a church that is amazing growth, saw an amazing results. And it wasn't because those people were amazing. It wasn't because those people uh, deserved that. It wasn't because they were smarter than us, more intelligent than us, more, uh, uh, anything more than we've got. They didn't have anything we didn't have. But something happened here. This church had what it needed for God to make it a great church. So I think if we want to be, become a great church, it would be good for us to study the church of Acts and find out what the church of Acts has that we need. And so look with me in Acts chapter 1 and verse 14 again. The Bible says, these all continued with one accord. Number one, I would say the first church had peace. The first church had peace. They were in one accord. They had absolutely no division. They had unity. Can I tell you that uh, you and I as humans, if we're not careful, we will rob our church of peace. We will rob our church of unity. This personal ego, personal pride personal p opinions. Amen. The Bible tells us that only by pride comes contention. 
Can I tell you what? In order for a church to be successful, everybody's got to be on the same page. Everybody's got to be in unity. And I believe we got that here. The truth of the matter is, there's a lot of love in this place. And praise God for it. Amen? And, 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 but, but if we want to stay a great church, we have to stay in unity. We cannot get into division. We cannot get into fussing and fighting and arguing. We cannot get into my way or the highway and I'm right and you're wrong. We cannot do that. That will rob a church of being a great church church when churches start fussing and fighting they lose the power of God they are no longer affecting in fact if there is division in a church a visitor can tell it are you listening you cannot hide division people that have any discernment come into a church I, I, I'll tell you, uh, my own personal appearance, uh, 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 experience, uh, we were running, the uh, first year we started a church with 20 people. Within a year we run 178. God was blessing us and blessing us. We went on, uh, uh, for several years, and in 19, it was in 1987, in 1993, we had a split. We had some people rise up. They got upset with me, uh, and, and they caused a split. And I'm going to tell you what, the atmosphere in there was so thick you could cut it with a knife. I mean, when people would come, walk in the door, you could feel it. They could sense it. We had some great people come and visit our church during that time, and they chose not to join our church. And I'll tell you why they chose. Because they knew there was a, there was a problem in the church. Amen. You see, the Spirit of God is where, there's, where the Spirit of God is, there is unity, the Bible says. When the Spirit of God is in control, there will be unity. Amen. Great church. Look at, at chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, And the day of Pentecost was fully come, and they were all with one accord in one place. Look at verse 46. And they continually daily in one accord in the temple. Look at Acts chapter 4 and verse 24. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. Acts chapter 4 and verse 32. And the multitude of them believed were of one heart and of one soul. Acts chapter 6 and verse 1. And in those days when the number of the disciples were multitude, there rose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. I believe the devil always will attempt to destroy what makes a church great. And this situation, back in that day, there was no welfare, amen. Back in that day, there was no social security, amen. And so God in his word, by the way, I still believe this is what we ought to be doing instead of what we're doing. He said in his word, it's the responsibility of the church to take care of the fatherless and the widows and the poor. And, and, and so they had all these ladies that got saved who had no husband. They had no job. By the way, if they have a child or a nephew that can take care of them, they're supposed to do it, not the church do it. Amen. That's another message. Amen. But they had some. So it was the job of the church to make sure these ladies got fed every day. And so they had a Meals on Wheels program. Amen. But what happened was the disciples, those 12, those 11, were taking care of all of it uh, because of, you know, and I guess Judas, and the new one was there that took his place. That was his name. I don't remember. But anyway, but uh, that they, they, were, they were there. And, and, but, but it got so big, the church got so big. Look, we're talking about there, 20,000, 30,000 people got so big that they just couldn't get to everybody every day. And when that happened, some of those Grecians got upset because you went and took meals to the Hebrew people. You didn't take meals to the, uh, uh, the uh, Grecian. You know, there's always been racial issues. Amen. <laughs> You know, uh, you prefer them over us, and you're more concerned about them over us. And, and, and it kind of started division. And pray, pray, praise God, the Holy Spirit led him to call out deacons. Can I tell you what a deacon's for? He's not to run a church. He's to serve. Amen. He's a table waiter. He's a servant, by the way, which is the greatest position you can have. The greatest is the servant of all. Amen. Not the greatest is not Lord. I, I put on Twitter this week, Pastor, are you looking for a monarchy or a ministry? Are you looking to be served or to serve? Are you looking to be loved or to love? No pastor is, is supposed to be looking for a monarchy. He's supposed to be looking for a ministry. No Christian is supposed to be looking for a monarchy. They're supposed to be looking for a ministry. No Christian is supposed to be looking to be served. They're supposed to be looking to serve. Nobody's supposed to be looking to be loved. We're supposed to be looking to love. Amen? And uh, so the disciples, I'll call out, uh, a, 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 and they have the, the, the deacons take that job so they can stay the prayer and the ministry of the world, uh, of, the, of the word. Don't turn there, but Matthew 12, 25, Jesus says, knew their thoughts and said of them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. 
You see, if we're going to be a great church, we have to be at peace with each other. You know, if it's, if it's, if it's an issue that is, is, is uh, doctrinal, then we need to deal with it. But if it's an issue that's personal, you need to get it dealt with. And if you've got a hatchet, you need to bury it. Amen. And if you haven't forgive, you need to learn to forgive. Amen. Those things are necessary if we're going to be a great church. Amen. You see, a house divided itself cannot stand. Abraham Lincoln used that verse during the Civil War. It just makes sense. Amen. That's just truth, and, and that's why this church was so successful because at this time in this church, they were all in one accord. They had one focus, one mind. They were at peace with each other. Well, number two, number two. Oh, let me just give you Psalm 133, 1 if I can. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. What a blessed verse. The Bible says that God hates those that stir up strife amongst the brethren. Amen. We should get along with each other. I have determined to get along with people. I'm a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers. Now, I'm not a peace freak as far as no, no war. Amen. I'm not a peace freak as far as you just let evil succeed. But I'm, for, for the church and the work of God, we need to be peacemakers. Amen. Blessed are the peacemakers. Brother, I want to be in agreement with you. I want to have peace between you and me. I'm not here to fight. Amen. I am here to fight. Fight the devil. Amen. But I'm not here to fight the work of God and fight the, the men of God. Amen. So number two, look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 14 again. Amen. We're going to keep running to these verses. Hope you'll look with me. Acts chapter 1 and verse 14. These all continued in one core in what's the next word prayer number two this is a great church because they had prayer it was a great church because they had peace it was a great church because they had prayer now brother howard did a great job uh, teaching on prayer this kind cometh forth not but by prayer and fasting and i'm gonna tell you what dear friend we'll never be a great church till we really learn how to pray amen i'm not saying now i lay me down to sleep pray the lord my soul to keep that's not what kind of prayer i'm talking about I'm not talking about good food, good meat. Thank you, Lord, that heat. That's not what kind of prayer I'm talking about. I'm talking about serious prayer. He talked about fasting and prayer. The Bible talks about the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. The Bible talks about the kind of prayer Jesus, when teaching on prayer, the disciples said to Jesus, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. They never asked Jesus to teach them to preach. They never asked Jesus to teach them how to perform a miracle. They never asked Jesus to teach them how to win somebody to Christ. They said, teach us to pray. Because I want to tell you what, if you get me where you're a prayer, I'll tell you that stuff will be given to you. I'm telling you that when you start praying like you're supposed to, you will find those things that you need. Amen. And this church was a praying church. Amen. You know, and, and I, I tell you what, our church is better in prayer meeting on Wednesday night than a lot of churches. I go to churches all over America and they don't even take prayer requests. I go to churches all over America and they take prayer requests. They, they hand them in on a piece of paper. Somebody stands and reads them. One guy gets up and prays, and then they go on with the service. That's not prayer meeting. We take our requests and we spend time to get on our knees and pray. And you study this. I got a sermon. I wanted to preach it tonight in Acts chapter 4. When they were threatened, the Bible says they went to their, their, their people, and the Bible, it's in there. I, I was going to look at it here later, but I'll just mention it. The Bible says, and he went to them, and they told him what happened. And the Bible said, and when they had prayed, when they had lifted up their voice in one accord, the place was shaken where they prayed, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Can I tell you that you're, you're, it is not only the preacher who's supposed to be filled with the Holy Ghost. It's not only a preacher who's supposed to have that anointing power of the Spirit. And I'll tell you, you can't get that power because Jesus said, he talks about the prayer. He says he talked about the prayer of the, uh, the, the lady who came and, and, and she said to the judge, uh, avenge me of mine enemies. And he said, I will not. But because of your continual coming, that's the kind of prayer you need to do. He talks about the man who well, he had company come and he had no bread to give him, so he goes and knocks on the door. And his friend said, I'm in bed, I'm not giving you. He kept knocking, kept knocking. He uses the word importuni, which means to bug to death, not stop. And he makes this statement, and he and shall not give God shall not give the shall not God give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him, though he bear along with them. You see, God wants to make us great Christians. God wants to make our churches where great and mighty things come to pass. But the secret to that is our prayer life. Praying. Together, in one accord, praying. 
You see, what God did mighty things, it was because the church got together and in one accord they prayed together. Amen. I'm telling you, dear friend, I go, around the, I go around the country preaching revival, and I say to churches, if you want revival, you need to start prayer meetings, cottage prayer meetings, Friday night prayer meetings, prayer meetings that are designed just to get together to pray, not to play. Look, I, I'm old enough. I've been, I've been around long enough. I've seen things that many of you young people have never seen because you have never been in a generation of people that understood about prayer. I, we used to have cottage prayer meetings before revival. What is cottage prayer meetings? We go to somebody's house. We don't drink coffee. We don't eat cookies. We go to somebody's house, and we spend the time not there playing games, not there fellowshipping. We take prayer requests, and we get down on our knees, and as a group, everyone prays individually at the same time, seeking from God that we would see a revival, see souls saved, praying, calling people's names out. And I've seen hardened people that, not let you share the gospel. I've seen them broken at an invitation, running to an altar and getting saved because the church learned how to pray. One has once said, all of our failures are prayer failures, and I think I believe that. Amen. I've heard this statement, you can do, you can't do much, uh, 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 you can't do, you can't, can't do much without prayer, or something like this, but you can't do, uh, you can't do much without prayer. I don't remember how it goes. How did that go? Oh, well, I guess I wasn't supposed to say it. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 24. Look what it says. And they, what? Prayed. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, and breaking bread. And in what? Prayers. Acts chapter 4. I mentioned that to you. Look with me if you would. In uh, verse number, uh, I won't go through all of this. Let me find it here. Acts chapter 4 and uh, verse number 28. Look, it says for, uh, no, that's not the one I'm looking for. Look at verse number uh, 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they assembled together. Go to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Look at verse 3. Acts chapter 6 and verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look you out among you seven men, an honest report full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who we may appoint over the business. But we will give ourselves continually to what? Prayer. They understood the importance of prayer. Go to Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. By the way, can I tell you, I, I believe that Pastor Holman was a prayer warrior. And you see, a lot of things happen under pastor's ministry because pastor knew how to pray. Amen. I'm not so concerned about how great somebody can preach. I'm concerned about how well they can pray. Any of you know Tom Williams? We had Tom Williams here. Remember Tom Williams, cowboy preacher? Tom Williams is a prayer warrior. Tom Williams prays often all night long. Tom Williams rises up early. He prays for hours. I've personally been aside Dr. Williams and listened to the man pray. He said to me one time, Brother Houston, if somebody said to me, you can either lose your prayer or lose your Bible, which would you choose? He said, I'll choose losing the Bible. He says, because I know the Bible, I can memorize the Bible, but if they take my prayer from me, I have no power. I tell you, it's ridiculous for you and I to think that we can do anything without prayer. It's ridiculous for you and I to think that we'll ever have a great ministry or great churches without us learning how to pray. Prayer is the absolute See, You see the whole armor of God, amen? Put on the whole armor of God. You got the sword of the Spirit. That's the Bible, amen? You got on the helmet of salvation. You got the breastplate of righteousness. You got the loins girded about with tree, the feet uh, shod with the gospel, the preparation of the gospel. And then it says in the end, and praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Can I tell you something, dear friend, uh, that all that armor except the Bible is a defensive armor. It helps you to stand. The Bible is an offensive armor. But you know what prayer is? Prayer is the military. Amen? Prayer stand is bringing in the Air Force. Amen? God, we need you to bomb this place. Amen? I don't know if you looked at it yesterday, but uh, they, uh, they did some killing of some ISIS people. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen? And uh, it was done by uh, regular army with the air support 
of the Russians and other uh, uh, forces. And you know what? When you start bringing in the big guns, big things happen. Amen? And I'm telling you, when you and I get God in it, we'll see something. Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. And I'll tell you what, if we really got serious with prayer means, I mean effectual prayer means, I mean weeping and crying, broken heart prayer means, I mean when we're, we're so burdened about it, we don't care if we eat prayer meetings. We see great, do great, God do great and mighty things. But you see, prayer today, uh, prayer is not easy. Amen? Can you say that? Can anybody help you agree with that? It's not easy. And today, we are so busy, we don't have time to pray. We've scheduled God clear out of our lives. We don't have time to pray. If you don't have time to pray, you don't have, you're, 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 you're in trouble. Those disciples recognize, I can go wait on these tables. I can do all this work, but I need to spend my time in prayer. Prayer. Boy, I tell you what. I was so blessed. The day God put me in the path of some people that were different than what I grew up. Different than this. You know, I don't, I, don't want, I don't want to try to be critical, but, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's all structured around what we, we believe and our opinion instead of, instead of uh, let's get in the Bible. Let's just try to do what the Bible says. I remember the first time I went to a church and they had a prayer meeting with the men before we had services. Amazing. That should be going on at every church. It should be going on here. Before we have a service, the men ought to meet somewhere and pray. Why don't we? Because we don't have time. It means I'm going to have to get here a little early. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not, really, honestly. I'm just simply saying to you, when, when Spurgeon preached, he had 150 men under his pulpit praying while he was preaching. A guy, a, a, a man from America, went to England, wanted to see Spurgeon, the great chapel there where Spurgeon preached. And when he walked in, a guy came out, a beard, kind of a ch- chunky type of guy, came out and said to him, uh, hey, I'm glad you're here. What can I do for you? He said, I just want to come and see this great place where Spurgeon preaches. He says, good, well, can I show you around? So he showed him around, took him up in the pulpit, let him stand in the pulpit, look over this great tabernacle, and, and, and showed him everything he wanted. And then finally, when he came to the end, the guy said, well, look, could I show you one more thing? Can I show you the power plant? And the guy thought to himself, you know, I don't want to go see the boilers. But he's been so kind to show me everything. Let me stand in the pulpit where Spurgeon preaches. So he said, okay. He said, if that's what you want to do, I'd be glad to see it. So Spurgeon took him down the basement to an empty room. And he said, here's the power plant. He said, by the way, my name is Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He said, I just wanted to show you where the power comes from. You understand why there's so many people getting saved here and why this great church exists here? Because every time I stand in the pulpit while I'm preaching, there's 150 men down here on their faith, in face, in unity, calling out to God. You find this church praying all the time. What are they praying? Behold, under thy, behold thy threatening, grant unto thy servants boldness. They're waiting. They're tearing in Jerusalem, praying. And let's have the power from on high that you promised. Oh, God, we need the power. That's what made them a great church. I'm not talking about another Pentecost here, folks. I am not Pentecostal. Not one bone in my body is Pentecostal, okay? I don't believe in shaking and falling out on the ground. I don't believe in speaking in some tongue that isn't audible. Amen. I don't believe in that stuff. But I do believe in the power of God. I do believe that God wants to move and does move in mighty ways, but He doesn't do it if a church doesn't pray. Amen. What made a great church is that they had peace. What made them a great church is that they had prayer. What made them a great church is that they had power. Look at Acts chapter 2, which, by the way, was a result of peace and prayer. Amen. If you have peace and prayer, you'll have power. And look in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them others. Now, I'm going to tell you what the day of Pentecost tongues was. They spoke in Galilee, and every man heard them speak in their own language. Amen. It was not a gibberish. They spake normal language, and God had some people there that He wanted them to get saved. He wanted them to hear the gospel. So God did a miracle of making those people hear what they said 
in their own particular language. Amen. It is not the modern day tongues that people are promoting to. By the way, the Bible says, where there be tongues, they shall cease. I personally do not believe that the power of tongues has, has ceased. I believe this. I believe that we don't use it and we don't have it much anymore because people are willing to communicate. We have the Bible in their language. However, I have a friend of mine, uh, and you can call him Ken Spilger, at Grace Baptist Church in St. Louis, who had a Chinese lady come to his church. And that Chinese lady could not speak a lick of English. He tried to talk to her. He couldn't speak a lick of Chinese. And he tried to talk to her before the service, and no, they couldn't communicate. She sat through the service and listened to him preach. And he tried to talk to her after the service, couldn't communicate. She left. She came back the next week, sat in the service. And at invitation time, she came down to the altar to pray. He knelt down beside her, tried to talk to her. He couldn't talk to her. She couldn't talk to him. And she kept coming back to church. He didn't know what's going on. He had a missionary from China come. He said, I want to take you. I want you to go over and visit this lady. She's been coming. She doesn't speak English. All she speaks is Chinese. And I want you to go talk to her because I'm concerned about her soul. So they went to visit her. When they got there, he began to talk to her in Chinese and began to say to her, you've been coming to church. Pastor says you don't understand English. And he doesn't understand Chinese. And, of course, he was speaking in Chinese to her. He said, concerned that you, you, you understand how to go to heaven. And he began to go through the gospel. And she said, well, that's what preachers preach. And I came to the altar and accepted Christ as Savior. I mean, God can do anything he needs to to see somebody saved. Amen. And God wants to do mighty things. He wants to do power. We are commanded in Ephesians to be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit of God. They had power. Look at it. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Peter preached. It says, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Can I say something to you? Nobody makes a decision because of a good message. People make a decision because the Holy Spirit pricked them. And when people don't make decisions, it tells me the Holy Ghost isn't working. I spend my life as an evangelist praying. I don't spend my days playing. I don't spend my days watching TV and playing golf. I spend my days on my face before God saying, God, we've got to have a moving. We've got to have you meet with us. God, we've got to see something happen and change. And I promise you, God is hearing those prayers. And God has filled altars. And God has done great and mighty things. Not because of somebody, who, not because I am, but because God has the power and He answers prayer. I think I've mentioned this before and it's, it's a sacred time, but it needs to be heard. And I tell you what, I've seen these things happen. I've, I've been to these things. I've experienced them. At football camp, we were, and we've always had great movings of God there. I want to tell you why we have great movings of God there. I pray every day, and most of the men that go there pray every day of the year for football camp. I prayed for them yesterday. I'll pray for football camp today when I finish up praying my prayers. Every day I pray for football camp. There's a host of preachers and laymen around the America who pray specifically that God would move in that place in a mighty way. And God's never failed us. But one year it was tight and things weren't happening. And Brother Woodward and Brother Booth who run the camp brought us in and said, Fellas, we're not seeing the moving of God like we're used to here. What's wrong? Let's talk about it. Well, Brother Sanny, who had been one of the original guys, a layman whose heart was so burdened for young men, he was our most faithful prayer warrior. I know Brother Sanny spent hours a, a, a week praying for football camp. He died that year, and things weren't happening. And Brother Dean Noonan raised his hand. He said, you know, when Spurgeon preached, he had 150 men praying for him while he was preaching. He said, preacher, we're not, we're not praying like we used to. He said, I really think, I think that what we need to do is while a man of God is preaching the chapel service, some of us need to be somewhere in prayer. We all agreed. And so Brother Noonan's red team took the first session. It was a session that I preached during the day. And the truth of the matter is, I did not want to preach. I went in the pulpit. I really didn't even have a message. I went in the pulpit dead and dry. I said to God all night, I pled with God all night, don't make me go. Let somebody else go. God, I don't have anything to give. I walked in the pulpit used this verse, ye that love the Lord hate evil. I said, it says, ye that love the Lord, that's qualifying. There are those who love the Lord, there are those who don't love the Lord. And I said, you know what, I'm supposed to love the Lord with all my heart. And I said, I don't love God the way I should. And when I made that statement, a young man broke to the altar just sobbing. Behind him, a national evangelist. And within 15 seconds, that whole place was empty. And for, and for, for, for over two hours... 
Men were on their face. I ran out of the building, went in the back and wept and said, God, I don't know what happened today. I think I preached my last sermon. I can't explain it to you. I was a dead man. I felt nothing. I didn't feel any goosebumps. I didn't feel, I felt like a dead man. I felt like I was screaming. Uh, I was, felt like I was screaming and words were going right here. If you've ever preached, you know there's times when you really feel like you got it and it's really going. There's times you feel like you're just preaching in a barrel. And I felt like I was preaching in a barrel. I thought, God, I'm done. And Brother Woodward said, Brother Houston, come here. You need to see this. He walked me through the auditorium. And all over the auditorium were puddles of tears. For over two hours, without somebody begging and pleading, without somebody pumping it with the music, without somebody doing all that stuff that we do to try to get people to move, the Holy Spirit of God moved. And people's lives were impacted forever. For two years, we had a, a, a youth revival. My youth pastor wanted to have a youth revival. He said, Brother Houston, I don't want to have a youth conference. I want to have a youth revival. I said, I'm for that. And so we made a commitment, our church, and we made a commitment to begin to pray for that. Personally, I, I fasted for two weeks. Didn't eat a thing for two weeks. And prayed for two weeks. People in our church fasted and prayed. First service, Josh Levins got up and he taught on uh, parent and child relationship. And before he finished that sermon, kids started coming to the altar. When he finished that sermon, the kids just came in a wave. But here's what's interesting. The kids came in a wave, weeping and crying. Then they went back to their seats. And all we had was just the music play. And I went up, took the invitation. I said to my youth man, go sit down. I want you to mess this up. <laughs> You know, he, I, don't, I just think he's, you, you, don't need to, you don't need to do God's work for him. Amen. I just said God's work and we're just going to wait on him. I went and sat down. For an hour and a half, I just sat there and I watched this. I watched as young people came to the altar weeping, got things right. I watched him go back. I watched him stand in the pew for about five or six minutes with just the songs going. And then I saw him come back to the altar. I saw young people making two, three and four trips to the altar. You know what happened? They let God work in some area of their life. They got it right. They went back to their seat, and God said, now there's something else I want to deal with you about. And they came and got it right. And then he said, there's something else. I want you. you know what that's called? That's called a moving of the Holy Ghost. You know what caused that? Prayer. You know what that is? That's power. You know, a lot of our converts are our converts, not God's converts. Dr. Carl Hatch was my personal friend. He's called Mr. Soul Winner. Dr. Hatch said to me, Brother Houston, there are a lot of Carl Hatch converts in the world. He said it wasn't the Holy Spirit that brought him to Christ. It was Carl Hatch that tricked him into accepting Jesus. <laughs> you know, we have to start using that kind of stuff because we don't have power. We have to start having these programs and all this stuff to try to work up something because we don't have power. We need power. That church had the power of the Holy Ghost. I read a book one time that ruined me. I don't agree with everything in it. It's called Deeper Experiences of the Christian Faith. I challenge you to read it sometime. I challenge you to study about Moody's filling of the Holy Ghost and Finney's filling. Finney got saved and got filled with the Holy Ghost the same night. He's headed to his job and he got such conviction he ran into the woods and accepted Christ as Savior. And then while he was sitting in his office, his law office that day, the Holy Spirit was really working his heart and he knew that God wanted to do something. So he went to the, the, head, the boss of that he said, uh, can I use your office tonight? I need to have a place of solitude. And the boss said, and he went in that office and that night the Holy Ghost filled him with the Holy Spirit. When Finney, listen to me, Finney, had such power, he go places, preached hundreds and hundreds of souls. When Moody got filled with the Holy Ghost, when he had 10 people getting at the altar, he said, after that, I had hundreds of people at the altar. Finney had such an anointing of the Holy Spirit, he walked, this guy had, he was doing a revival somewhere, and he walked in, this guy had a textile factory, this woman work, working where they had looms that made the, you know, the cloth. And this guy said, come see my factory. He said, okay, I'll come and see it. He walked past a loom that a young lady was working on, and as he walked past, she came under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and began to weep and said, I need to get saved. And Finney led her to the Lord, and they closed down the factory and for two weeks every day. Finney preached and they had revival. This isn't the day of Pentecost, folks. Are you listening tonight?
Preacher, I, I don't see much happening with my ministry. I know. I don't see what I want to see either. Want to know why? Because it's not my might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. They had peace, they had prayer, and they had power. Look, look, look at me at verse number, chapter 5 and verse 5. No, go to chapter 4 and verse 33. We'll do there and I'll move on. Chapter 4 and verse 33. The Bible says, And with great power, with great power gave the apostles witness, witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They had peace. They had prayer. They had power. What makes us good church is when we're at peace with each other, when we pray like we should, and when we have the power of God. Number four, what made them a great church was preaching. Look at Acts chapter 5 and verse 42. And daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Go to Acts chapter 8 if you would. And verse number 4. Acts chapter 8 and verse number 1. Saul was consenting unto his death. That's the death of Stephen. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church. which was at Jerusalem. They were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria and ex except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Now look at verse 4. Therefore... They that were scattered abroad. See what happened? Paul came in and he messed up the church and, they, and they, were, they were persecuted and they scattered all regions. But what happened when that happened? Look at it. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere. What? Hmm. Can I tell you something? Brother Howard made a statement. Maybe it didn't, we didn't set well with Maybe we didn't like it. It was true. We don't have an attendance problem. We have a soul winning problem. Are you and I going everywhere preaching the gospel? Oh, God, do a great work. Oh, God, save souls. But I'm not going to witness. Folks, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm telling you. you know, what do you think? You expect that God, he, he chose the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise. He gave the job of sharing the gospel to the church. If we don't do the job, it's not going to get done. And God's not going to save people without a witness. How can I accept some man guide me? We keep our mouth shut. And people are not going to get saved. And the church is not going to grow. It doesn't grow by accident. It grows by labor. And I'm guilty. You know, I've found, I've never, I've never ever had this fail. When I go out and work at it, God always blesses. Always. And then I might win somebody to Christ and they might not come to church. But you know what I found? I go win somebody to Christ, they don't come to church. God sends somebody. They just walk in out of the blue. How did you get here? What did you come for? I've seen it in 26 years of pastoring, knocking those doors and winning folks to Christ and talking to people about coming. And boy, some of them say, I'll be there, I'll be there. And they don't show up, you know that. I mean, people are crazy. I mean, they're just, they, they slay you, man. I mean, I love people. But you do that. And say, well, boy, God, I worked and I labored and, and they led them to Christ and they won't come be baptized. And then all of a sudden, somebody shows up, amen? And say, well, God, where did that happen? He says, I've been watching you, boy. I know you're working, and I know that they're not, but I'm the one that gives the increase, amen? I'm the one that builds the church, amen? Your job is just go out and keep preaching. I tell you what, the great churches in America are the churches where they're out hitting the highways and the hedges, and they're telling people about Christ and inviting them to come in. And churches that aren't doing that, the only way that they get, and I'm not saying they're great churches, they get good attendance by substituting it with music, entertainment, socializing. I'm not against any of that. I like music. I don't mind us having fun and being entertained, and I don't mind socializing. But that doesn't make us a great church. Attendance will come, but attendance is not the measure of a great church. A moving and the working of God is a measure of a great church. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Lastly, and I'll be done, we see that they had persistence. They had persistence. Look at Acts chapter 4. And look with me at... Verse number 15, 
But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, what shall, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that is spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Now look at verse number 19. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge you. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Verse 21, So when they had further threatened them, they let them go. I want you to drop down now, if you would, please, with me to verse number 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Watch this. And they spake the word of God with boldness. I'm going to tell you something, dear friend. These folks had persistence. Yeah, listen, I, 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 I don't like, uh, soul winning is hard for me. Anybody else in here, soul winning is hard for you? It's hard for me. I'm an introvert. I don't like talking to people. I don't like talking to strangers especially. And I sure don't like talking to people that, that, that put a face on. I mean, you know, listen, when I walk to the door and somebody gives me one of them weird looks, uh, there, there's two things that go on in my, in my heart. Number one, I want to punch their lights out. And number two, it scares me. Fear is the greatest hindrance to soul winning. Carl Hatch came, he did soul winning classes. He said, first thing he did, Jeremiah 1.8. Be not afraid of their faces. He said, every time I go sewing, the greatest thing I have is I'm afraid. So every door I go to before I start, he says, God, it's Jerry, Jeremiah. I'm afraid of their faces. Give me boldness. But these folks threatened and beaten. They said, but we're going to keep doing what God told us to do. Can I tell you what happens to most soul winners? Is we go out and it gets tough and things aren't very fun and it's not easy. And so we quit. You know, it's great. You know, if first door you knock to, the person goes, oh, wonderful, so good to see you. Come in. I love those things. Amen. I love to say, come on in. Wow, you just go, hallelujah. God's prepared this one. By the way, I try to find the ones God's prepared. Amen. And you go in, you lead them to Christ. You walk in, wow, hallelujah. Woo, praise the Lord. And you're pumped up to go soul in it. Then you go to the door and you knock on the door. And the guy goes, what do you want? Well, I don't interest in that. Pooh. And I know about you, but I'm ready to quit. <laughs> God, you know, God, I mean, I'm just trying to serve you. They don't have to be so mean to me. Now, how many of us in here started soul winning and we quit? No, I don't raise your hand, okay? Why'd we quit? What's the reason? Fear, no success, or selfishness, self-centeredness, self-preservation, time schedules, what I want to do, whatever the reason is. Look, if we're going to be a kind of church that's great, a great church, we've got to stay persistent. We've got to stay at it. They went everywhere preaching the gospel, it says. Night and day, from house to house, teaching and preaching. Paul said, I, I take your record, I have ceased not for the space of three and a half years to preach the gospel. Persistence. Persistence. Look, Brother Gene Casey used to say to Second Baptist Church, before I got there, a great man of God started a great church, built a great church. Here's what he said to his people every day, every service. He said, it's always too soon to quit. It is always too soon to quit. Persistence. You know, sometimes, and I have, these, I have these feelings, I need to close, but when I go to every door, here's what I think. I'm sure the people there don't want me there. I'm sure they're going to be ugly and mean. You know, that's not what happens all the time, but that's what I was in my mind. And I got this picture, Brother Jesse, of some guy that's about four, four, four inches taller than you are. And he's about your size, he's been down to the gym, he's pumped all these muscles, and he's got tattoos on his, you know, and he's got one eyeball in the middle of his forehead, and he's got some fangs hanging out here with blood on them. And when I knock on the door to open the door, I say, I'm Pastor Houston from Central Baptist Church in Jefferson Mew. He's going, well, I don't want you here. Boom, 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 boom. And he's going to spit, man, we'll be a, I'm going to be a puddle of, of blood and guts there. And I, I fight that every time. Look, little old ladies scare me at the door. 
I'm just not. I'm, I, you say, well, I, you're not a very good Christian. No, I'm not. But I'll tell you something. I got, I, 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 when I went to kindergarten the first time, I couldn't get the door open. Ha, ha, I went home. When I had to start eating lunch, I got sick every day. When my mom and dad made me go to swimming lessons, I got sick so I didn't have to get in the water. My brother said to me several months ago, you're the most shy, timid boy I've ever met. Mom and dad had to make you do everything. I am an absolute, total, scaredy-cat introvert. Not when I play football. Not when I'm around my friends. But any time I have to do something that is not normal or, or comfortable to me, <laughs> but you know, his disciples didn't enjoy getting threatened. Paul didn't get, enjoy getting beaten. But he said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And no matter what you do to me and what you say to me, I am going to keep doing what God told me to do. And that's what made him a great church. They had peace. They had prayer. They had power. They were preaching, and they were being persistent at it. And I have never seen a church that kept its peace, its prayer life, and its, its, its power, and its preaching, and its persistence, right, that God has not blessed it. Pastor worked hard. Pastor knocked doors. And when pastor worked hard and knocked doors, you know what we saw? We saw people in here. People left, now who's doing the work? The pastor left, now who's doing the work? Well, I'm not doing it. Like I should, just to be honest with you. So I'm to blame. But if we want to be a great church. These are the things we need to do. I'm not trying to be mean tonight. I'm not trying to rip your faces off. I'm trying to show you that this is the greatest church and we ought to learn from them. And we ought to, we ought not buy into this neo-evangelical philosophy. We ought not buy into this church planning stuff. Amen. You know, I'm sick and tired of leadership conferences. How about let's go out and reach people conferences? You know, we've got everything glitzed up and glamoured up so it's like the world and everybody comes in. Boy, this is wonderful. You know what? But I don't think God's impressed with that. I think God's impressed when we get our hearts right and start doing the work of God the way we're supposed to. And I'm guilty tonight. I'm going to take, take first place at the altar tonight and say, God, help me. I need help. I need power. I need to be out preaching the gospel. And I need to be persistent about it, even if it's difficult, if it's hard. Even if I'm threatened. I've been watching this ISIS thing. Have you watch this? I'm going to just tell you folks, I think it's a serious issue. It's serious. I think it's terribly serious. I don't care what the president said. It's not an existential threat to America. <coughs> They are trying to threaten our existence. It is their goal to destroy our existence? You can say what you want to. But here's what's been grabbing me about this. All of these Christians that are dying for their faith. And I don't even have enough guts to talk to somebody about Jesus. Well, we, I'm an American Christian, and boy, I'm a preacher, and I know the Bible. Oh, who cares? Would you die for your faith? Are you willing to suffer for the cause of Christ? If you won't suffer with me, you won't reign with me. All that live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer. Excuse me, I'm not suffering, so something's not right here. Amen. I just, I, I need God's help because I'm going to tell you what, and I make this statement, I need to make it. I told you I, I should have made it this morning. Listen, if living Christian was easy, everybody would do it. And if being a soul winner and being what we're supposed to be for God was easy, we'd all be doing it. Everything I gave you tonight is not easy. It's not easy to keep peace. It's not easy to pray. It's not easy to have the power of God. It's not easy to go out and keep preaching to God. It's not easy to be persistent. But that's what makes a great church, okay? All right? And this should be our desire, God. We want to be like that first church of Acts. We want to have your power and your blessings. We want to see you do what only can be attributed to God, not man. I pastor for 26 years. Sometimes when you're in a ministry, you can't see the forest because of the trees. Sometimes you can't see what God's doing because so, you're so busy trying to keep ahead and keep running. 
And after I've gotten out of that, I've had some time to look back at our ministry. And I've gotten on my face several times and say, God, I just, I just never realized what a miraculous, marvelous work you did. And I never appreciated and thanked you like I should. I look back at the ministry that God did, and I say to myself, it's an absolute miracle and amazing what God did with a bunch of people in a roller skating rink. To God be the glory. But you know what? Our hearts were on fire for souls. They interviewed me after the first year when we were running 178 a year. They said, what do you attribute the success of your ministry to? I said, because we have focused on winning souls to Christ. See, God never told us to build a social club. God never told us that our job was to even build a church building. God told us our job was to reach people with the gospel. Amen? That's what will make any church a great church. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. My, Miss